Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into Your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for Your, for your love and for Your grace, for the Holy Spirit that You've given us, that You've given us the earnest of the Spirit, that You've established us, You've made us complete in Christ, that You've hid our life with Christ in God. We just give You all the praise and the honor and the glory. Filter out all of that which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, I thank you for joining us. This is our Sunday uh, series of studies in uh, 2 Corinthians. Uh, we're studying uh, together the second epistle of Corinthians. We went through 1 Corinthians. You'll find that in our playlist. Uh, we're going through it verse by verse. And last week we looked at verses 15 through 24 of chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The Holy Spirit is pointing out to the believers at Corinth that underlying everything that happens there is the direction of the Holy Spirit. And and that direction being for their good. That there was not uh, human vacillation and error that came into the plans of the Apostle Paul, but rather there was the constant faithfulness of a sovereign God that works all things together for the good, that works together things for the good of the believers at Corinth. And that's pretty much where we uh, were at uh, last week. Uh, there was not carnal vacillation, but the direction of the Holy Spirit in the work that was taking place at Corinth and in the lives of the believers at Corinth. And... Uh, in the activities of, as well as the activities of Paul and, and Silas and Timothy. And this so that the believers at Corinth might be encouraged, that they might be comforted, and that they might be taught in the things of Jesus Christ. At verse 18, the change of subject is dramatic. Our God is faithful, and I pointed out how that the word true there in the authorized text is pastuo. The word means is faith. God is faithful. And it's amazing over the years, the faithfulness of God, how that it's it's been a how it's been such a neglected subject over the, over the the past several generations. Somehow, a hundred, a hundred and fifty years ago, the great emphasis in so-called Christianity changed, and it changed from the faithfulness of God to the faithfulness of man. And uh, the major emphasis has been on man's production man's surrender, man's yieldedness, and, and man's faithfulness, and man's everything, really. And folks, I am no expert in the field of human relationships. But the greatest problem that I've seen in Christian lives over a, period, a span of 40 some odd years are problems that have come about as a result of that great emphasis on man's faithfulness rather than God's. There's this uh, popular uh, but, but horrible idea in our time that basically says, well, if, if he's Lord, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all, and folks, I've never found the reference for that verse. 
It's always struck me as just a little bit strange that a group of Christians would get together and loudly proclaim their conservative, fundamental approach to the Scriptures and choose a theme or, or, or a key verse that isn't even in the Bible. And I've known people, I've personally known people, that as a result of that theme, They've become persuaded that they're not redeemed. They can't be redeemed because, well, because they're fully aware that there are some areas of their life where they haven't that they haven't surrendered. There's some areas of their life where they don't consider Christ to be Lord. He really doesn't have total control over some area of my life. Therefore, he must not be my Lord at all because the verse says if He's not Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. And dearly beloved, there is no such verse. Folks, it doesn't matter how you live. You're not going to change the Lordship of Christ. Whether you believe at this moment in time that Jesus Christ is Lord or not doesn't make it a hill of beans. Your belief will not make Him Lord and your unbelief will not remove Him from Lordship. The truth of the matter is, is that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And no matter what your puny convictions might be, you're not going to change the facts of the case. Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. And whatever the believers at Corinth might have thought about the activities of Paul, or the, the vacillations of, of his team of Bible uh, teachers didn't make any difference. The truth of the matter is God was in control. I pointed out in a previous video how that our sovereign God is in, control, is in con absolute control of your life, even in the little things. You and I are established because of the faithfulness of God, not the faithfulness of man. According to my text that I'm reading, and my mind is constantly being drawn toward the faithfulness of God. He bottles my tears. He lights my candle. My times are in His hand. He's branded my name on the palms of His hand. He knows the way that I take. And when He's tested me, when He's tried me, I shall come forth as gold. I shall come forth as gold. There's not the least indication that I may not. I shall come forth as gold. He'll never leave me. Nor will He ever forsake me. I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present or things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, and that first, that first included myself, that, that those creatures include myself, shall be able to separate me from the love of God which is in Jesus Christ my Lord. I'm told that for by one offering, He's perfected me forever. He set me apart for Himself. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Lo, I am with you until the end of the age. All things work together for good to them that, who love God 
to those who are the called according to his purpose. And if Jesus Christ died in my place, if Jesus Christ died in your place, you will not die. God is faithful. There wasn't any vacillation in that preaching. It was declared to be the truth of the Word of God. And it is the truth of the Word of God. Some of you may remember back in 1 Corinthians where uh, we went through that entire epistle. Where was the verse that questions the salvation, the eternal life of the people at Corinth? Where was it? Where's that verse at? You cannot find a more carnal, fleshly body of believers than those at Corinth. I'm not suggesting that they were more carnal than, than, than those at, at Philippi or, or those at Ephesus or those at Colossae. I don't know that. What I do know, what I'm absolutely certain of, is that if I were to put my finger on a group of believers that God has revealed to be carnal, I would have to nominate, number one, the believers at Corinth. And where, I ask you, where? In all of that epistle, just show me one verse. Is there any question of their eternal relationship with God? If anyone were to find the slightest indication in the Word that the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ is not sufficient for your redemption, regardless, and I mean regardless of the mess that, that you make of your life, one would look for it in 1 Corinthians, but even as the Holy Spirit begins and prepares himself to lay out for those believers at Corinth the ghastly revelation of their carnality. He lays a foundation of God's faithfulness, of His faithfulness. In the first chapter of 2 Corinthians, where we're at right now, we read God is faithful. In the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, it also says God is faithful. And he says that before he, he ever begins to deal with the carnality that's rampant in Corinth. He deals with the faithfulness of God. The Holy Spirit speaks of the permanency of their, the eternality of their relationship with God and the sufficiency of the grace of God. And not once, not once, in, in all of the epistle, is their eternal life ever brought into question. Folks, if we don't have a message in this life of the faithfulness of God and the grace of God, folks, then we have no message at all. God is faithful. And what was declared was the Word of God. Dearly beloved, listen. One could preach a heartfelt, emotional message that Moses never, well, Moses never got into the promised land uh, and, the, and the price that he paid, you know, is a terrible price. And maybe if we, well, if we just worded it just right, we could bring tears to the eyes of everyone that heard us. And of course, you know, which, that, that would keep our listeners in, in fear You know, and whether I do that with a confessional, a con confession booth, or, or some kind of pledge, or, or some kind of guilt 
that I proclaim from the pulpit, you know, so that you're, you are constantly under the fear of the judgment of God. But that fear totally annihilates the liberty and the freedom that we have in Christ and that these believers in Corinth, that they had in Christ. All I have to pro proclaim is all I have to give you folks is the glorious liberty of the grace of God. You know, that, that you're going to heaven or going to hell is not the least dependent upon whether you make Jesus Lord of your life or not. Jesus Christ is Lord, whether you make Him Lord or not. I pointed out to you last week in 2 Peter that how that the Almighty God declared, I've given you all things that pertain, all things that pertain to life and godliness. And folks say, well, well, that's fine, but, you know, Steve, you know, I need the Ferrari, I need the Lamborghini, or, you know, or, you know, or in my case, you know, I, you know, the large con uh, country ranch, the greener pastures, the prettiest, fastest horse, you know, I, you know, why can't my horse be as good as, as the horse of my friends? I'm sure some of you folks have garages bigger than my barn. And, and I'm sure some of you, some of, in some of them you, where you can eat off the garage floor. And, and then I'm reminded that He's given me all things. All things. All things that pertain to life and godliness. And so I am forced to reach the conclusion in my own mind and in my own life, that those things are, are not of the greatest importance to me. That is not where my energy comes from. It's not where my enthusiasm comes from. Or my dedication or devotion or anything else, but from the promises of God that are true and that God is faithful. Always faithful. So why would I how could I lord it over your faith? And yet the systems that are really growing today are the systems that promote physical well-being. You know, and folks, you can hardly lose on that. You know, if that's what you want to preach, if... You know, if, if things aren't going so good for you, I can always question your faith. And, you, and well, and you, of course, you already know. When I do that, you already know that your faith isn't really all that great. So the guilt works great, and you just got to keep trying to get up to, well, you know, some of the rest of those people who are, uh, oh gosh, they're just li they're just living examples of heaven on earth. Everybody, everything's going fine with them. It's you that's suffering. And, fo and folks, we took a look at this suffering. Not one bit of it was had any relationship to personal sin in the context. The chapter opened with suffering, but God doesn't present suffering as a result of my lack of faith. He presents the suffering as a very kind, gracious activity of the Almighty God, all loving God, to teach me and to trust and to rest and to hope. Therefore, I should rejoice in Him because He's given me all things that pertain unto life and godliness, whether I, that appears to, to be the case or not. We came down to verse 21. He established us. He anointed us. And, and that's contrary to much of what I read today, much of what I hear taught today. How, 
How are you established? Well, you're established by accepting, repenting, regretting, changing your mind, receiving, shaking the pastor's hand, walking, walking down the aisle. I don't know. It, some way, you know. That's how you're established. But here, dearly beloved, here I'm told that you are established by God. It's a straight, simple fact straightforward fact you're established by God he did it you can declare that you're not established very well but I, I wouldn't really recommend that you were absolutely established in your family by your mother and your father didn't matter what your what your mind was about it didn't matter what your attitude was didn't matter what you what your your will was you know, I might have been a poor son, and, and, and I may have thought that my father at times was a poor father, but the truth of the matter, dearly beloved, is that I was firmly established in that family. Not another one, but in that one. A lot of times I, I wished I was maybe, I remember, you know, thinking I wished I was of this other, other family, but... It, that's true in the human realm, and that is surely true in the spiritual. I hear very few sermons on the faithfulness of God, and I hear very few sermons on the provisions of Christ. I'm told that my life is hid with Christ in God. Who did that? Who did the hiding? Did I do that? Did I hide my life with Christ in God, or did God hide my life in Christ? Did I make myself a joint heir with Christ? Who made me a joint heir with Christ? Well, God did. I'm established by God, and that establishment is based upon, not my faith, it is based upon the faithfulness of a God who loved me and gave Himself for me. What if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Paul wrote to Timothy, you know, if we deny him, he cannot deny himself. And, you know, it's astounding to me that in the, in the presence of, of so-called Christianity outside of the interpersonal relationships where I'm not skilled, my greatest counseling effort are with people who believe that they're going to hell. You know, they used to, I'm talking about people, they used to think that they were Christians, and, but now they're going to hell. You know, should I capitalize on that guilt? Or should I proclaim the, the peace of God? The peace of God that passes all understanding. Folks, if you click off this video burdened about your personal salvation, You haven't heard the Word of God. My Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 that if the Word of God is honestly preached here, you'll be encouraged. You'll be enlightened. You'll be comforted. You'll be taught. You will not be put under guilt or conviction, and if you are, then what I'm preaching is not the truth of this book. The greatest temptation that any man who proclaims the Word of God faces, at least as far as I'm concerned, his single greatest temptation is to put his believers, his listeners, his friends, his, his brothers and his sisters under law. And that is contrary to grace. Grace doesn't do that. Not only has God established us, but He sealed us. The Greek word means that He has, he has taken unto Himself the total obligation for our redemption.
It speaks of our security. He's made us secure. And He's given us the earnest of the Spirit. And if I remember right, I didn't really quite exactly know how to describe that uh, last week. What I can say is that when I look at the Holy Spirit, and I, and I can't give you a complete study on the Holy Spirit, but when I look at, at some of His attributes, attributes that, that come booming through the Word of, of God, I see that the Word of God is eternal. Uh, Hebrews 9, He's omnipresent in, in Psalms 1, uh, and He's omnipresent uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Those are the attributes of God. So the simple theological truth is that the Holy Spirit is God. He's God Almighty. You know, many a Christian loudly boasts that you know how that he believes in one God but but deep in his heart he believes in three you know Father Son and Holy Spirit three gods but the word of God reveals that these are one we are folks we are not polytheists okay we are monotheists we believe in one God one God who reveals Himself as Father and as Son and as the Holy Spirit. And these attributes speak directly to the deity of, of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit Himself is God Almighty. And we've been given the earnest of the Spirit. You remember in creation, the earth was without form and void and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. So the work of the Spirit speaks of creation. And He's made us new creations in Christ. In Psalms, He sent forth His Spirit and by His Spirit they were made. The worlds were made. The heavens were made. Everything was made. The work of the Holy Spirit involves inspiration. He inspires us. The, the Word itself is the inspired Word of God. In Titus, there's the work of the Spirit in regeneration or us quickening us to life, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, uh, nothing to do uh, with what we did, but according to His mercy, He delivered us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Scriptures declare that we are born not by the will of man but by or the will of the flesh, but we're born again by the will of God. He's the one in regeneration. But His work doesn't end there. He guides us into all truth. He teaches us things to come. He's our, he's our comforter. Our comforter. He convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He does not convict the believer of sin. The Holy Spirit's a witness. Romans chapter 8, His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. His work includes identification, baptism. We're, we are all by one Spirit identified with the body of Christ and He's given us the earnest of His Spirit. There's the filling of the Spirit. And, and since, and that's not if, since we live in the Spirit, it's a first class condition, let us also walk by the means of the Spirit. Folks, obviously you have the option of walking by means of the flesh 
or by means of the Spirit. Well, you cannot rule out Christian obligation. The believers at Corinth were walking by means of the flesh. But they were redeemed. They were not unredeemed. They were God's people. Now, they shouldn't have been walking that way for sure. I, just, as, just as my earthly father you know, didn't want me to do certain things, but if I did them, I was still his son. And it's not the redemption, folks. It's not the redemption of the believers at Corinth that was called into question. Nowhere, neither, neither in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, is their redemption ever called into question, but their fellowship with God is. There's the intercession of the Holy Spirit in Romans 8. He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. For by one offering He's perfected forever those whom He's set apart. He's set aside. You're perfected forever. Well, how long is that? How long is forever? I, I don't know. I think, I think it's a long time. I'm pretty sure it is. Now, how long is that? How long is forever? Until you sin the next time? Folks, I'm not going to be foolish and not take my Savior at His word. He said, my sheep will never perish. That's what my Lord said. In the Roman Catholic Mass or, or Mess, the Lord Jesus Christ is slain over and over again as a sacrifice for sin. Every time they, they do Mass, the word Protestant came from people whose minds were enlightened to the truth of the Word of God that rebelled against th that re-sacrificing of Christ over and over and, and over again, which has now come back into Protestantism where that now the majority, I will, and I'm, I don't think I'm exaggerating, the majority of Protestants today re-sacrifice the Lord Jesus Christ over and over and over again. When the Word of God declares without apology that we were perfected forever by His one sacrifice. He's not going to become crucified every time some new Christian or some new person decides that he's going to accept Christ. And if he doesn't accept Christ, well, then Christ didn't die for him. Folks, he died for him. That's why he accepted Christ. We accepted Christ because Christ died in our place. He doesn't die in our place because we accept him. Perfected forever, and forever is a long time. And, and folks, the earnest of the Spirit is not the work of the Spirit. The earnest of the Spirit is not the work of the Spirit, but it's the Holy Spirit himself. That's what God calls an earnest. Now, I'm, I'm fairly persuaded that what we, we would call an earnest is some foretaste of, oh, I know what the earnest of the Spirit is, Steve. That's a, you know, it's a, a mansion on a hilltop, you know, something to do with what we dream the glories of heaven to be. You know, it's that big green pasture I was telling you about or the, you know, the big ranch with all the pretty horses, or maybe it's a, I, I, whatever. And my Bible tells me that the only thing I know about glory is what the Holy Spirit's revealed. It's not, he says, it's not entered into the mind of man, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. You know, if you were to ask me, well, you know, Steve, you know, if you had one choice of glory, if you had, if you as an individual could have one choice of what heaven's going to be like, what would it be? And folks, I'd have to look you straight in the eye and say that I'd never sin against my Lord again.
isn't a single thing you could offer me in heaven that I can think of you know, that would transcend that one thought. That, that there would now be the time when I don't sin against Christ ever again. I'm told that the true dedicated believer today reaches a point where he doesn't sin, and I think the man that says that sins when he says that. Romans 6.11 exhorts us to reckon daily ourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ. And what God gave me is the earnest. The earnest is the Holy Spirit. It's not the work of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit Himself. That's the earnest of the Spirit. And His entire mission, the Holy Spirit's entire purpose, is to glorify not Himself, but Christ in fact, he didn't even reveal his name. Most Christians I talk to are not aware of the fact that, that it's God who established them. Now, if one has a, a body that's been racked with pain all their lives, and you know, maybe the greatest prospect of heaven to them is to be free of pain. You know, if one's been in poverty most of his life, well, maybe one of the greatest prospects of heaven is that he's, he's not poor anymore. I don't know. But many Christians have spent so much time dreaming and tr about and trying to imagine what heaven might be like in the context of their present situation that they haven't they haven't searched for what heaven is really like in the context of this book. I don't think it's any surprise that most uh, Christians are not aware of the earnest of the Spirit, but, but that doesn't change the truth that God has given us the earnest of the Spirit the down payment of the Spirit. And folks, I can't, if, if this is what He's given us as a down payment, I can't imagine what, what it's going to be like when we, when we get to heaven. In Hebrews chapter 10, I'm told that the sacrifices didn't work. It wasn't sufficient. It was a prototype. And now, and now along comes the Lord Jesus Christ, and He has by one offering perfected us forever. Therefore, He's removed the conscious guilt of sin. And that is a fantastic biblical concept. Dearly beloved, have you accepted the fact that you are not under law? If you have, and where no law is, where there's no law, there's no transgression. So in the biblical sense of transgression, you couldn't do it anyway because you're not under law. In fact, you've died to the law in order that you might bear fruit unto God. There could be no transgression in your life. And I'm sure many will misinterpret those words and say that what I'm saying is we can you know, stop sinning. Folks, that's why the sacrifice of Christ has removed the conscious guilt of sin. If you carry conscious guilt of sin, you're simply calling God a liar. He says that you've been perfected forever by one sacrifice, by being removed from the, the sphere of the law to the sphere of grace. If that isn't a small down payment of heaven, I, 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 can't, I can't imagine what, what is. 
You know, what a, what a devastating burden it is, a load to carry the guilt of sin that God never equipped nor intended for you to bear. We see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 because of the carnality that was rampant there in Corinth. I mean, what a mess. You know, incest, uh, uh, litigation before uh, believers and unbelievers alike, and insisting on your rights, uh, even though it might jeopardize the rights of another. Exalting yourself to a position that, that's absolutely foreign to the whole position of a, of a witness of Jesus Christ. Carnality going so far in that when we come, when, when these folks came together to break bread, they did it in an unholy manner. I don't see how the Holy Spirit could have done a better job in revealing to us the hearts of the believers at Corinth. So while we're suing other Christians, God wants us to know that He loves us. That He's given us the earnest of the Spirit. That He's established us. That He's perfected us forever by one sacrifice. And in the midst of all that carnality and all of that mess, the stress was on their fellowship with the Savior and their communion with Him and, and one another and, and with the Word of God. Not on, not on whether or not they were going to go to heaven or not. The one uh, chapter that's called into question is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, I wouldn't have you ignorant, brethren. This is, God wants, us to, wants them to know. I, I wouldn't have you ignorant, brethren. All our forefathers were under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all baptized uh, under Moses or into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock which followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God wasn't well pleased. So Steve, see, Steve, you know, you can, you can lose it. You know, and some commentator writes and he goes into to great... He goes into... To, great emotional lengths to prove that all those Israelites went to hell. They, all, the, ones, the ones with whom God was not well pleased. Everybody went to hell but Caleb and Joshua. And now I have a man who's supposed to be a thinker, a thinking man, sitting there in his, commenta his commentary saying that the sovereign God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who hung the stars in the sky, redeemed His people out of the land of Egypt with a high hand, and, and He said unto to them that ye are My people which I have redeemed, And it only worked for two. 1,490,999 One th one of them went to hell. Only two of them made it. I, folks, what kind of redemption is that? Moses never even made it. God was not well pleased with Moses. He says in Numbers... Chapter 12, uh, Moses, because of your unbelief, you will not take this people into the promised land. 
and yet and yet we know he stood on the Mount of Transfiguration by the grace of God. It was unbelief that kept him out of fellowship, but it didn't keep him out of heaven. And it was unbelief at Corinth that caused the devastation in their communion and in their fellowship with one another and with God. But it wasn't heaven and hell that was questioned. It was a relationship based upon the establishment of God in the earnest of the Holy Spirit. God did not give you the Spirit's work. He gave you the Holy Spirit as a helper, as a comforter, as a teacher. And He calls that an earnest of our redemption. Well, we're going to pick up more uh, next week. We'll probably be moving into the second chapter. I thank you for joining us. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.